right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. If you could please find your seats and your cell phones. And while everyone's uh, finding their seats, I would, I don't see Mr. Marino right now, but I would like to uh, recognize and acknowledge the support of Oats and Marino for sponsoring this symposium. Uh, these things are fun, they're important, and this one is free, uh, even though there's a lot of resources that go into it. So thank you very much to Oats and Marino for their wonderful support. And most of our programs back home are, are free in New Orleans, and even those that aren't free, we, uh, we sometimes need support for. So we really uh, appreciate those individuals and organizations that want to help get the knowledge out to the masses. Couldn't have been timed at a better time with the youngest audience members here. Uh, it's really important that you all continue your lifelong learning, but we also foster this amongst the next generation. And for some of us, those are couple generations behind us now. Um, David Reynolds is not only one of the United Kingdom's leading preeminent historians, but one of the world's. He is here for a twofer. He gave a speech at the museum on his latest book, The Kremlin Letters, which is about the wartime correspondence between Stalin, Churchill, and FDR, and it was a wonderful talk, so I know we're in and for a great talk here on In Command of History. He's a professor of international history and a fellow of Christ College in Cambridge. Don't make that mistake, I did it once and I'll never live it down. Uh, Cambridge, not Oxford. He studied at Cambridge and the other Cambridge, Harvard, and has been a regular visitor to the States since first coming here as a graduate student in 1973. He is the author of 12 books, his first dating back nearly four decades, 1981, and it includes In Command of History, which we'll hear about tonight, The Kremlin Letters, which we heard Wednesday. But most recently, it's a little bit of a change from his World War II focus, he has a new one, Island Stories, an unconventional history of Britain that just came out. Actually, I think it's due out in um, six weeks here in the States. It's been out in the UK, but uh, be on the lookout for it. He wanted to do it not solely on Brexit, but with Brexit being such an important epical event in British history, he wanted to go back and look at a thousand years of British history to sort of put it in perspective. Um, Professor Reynolds, with all of his titles, all of the articles he's contributed, um, perhaps the most distinguished award he's uh, received is the Wolfson Prize of 2004, which is um, the, one of the preeminent awards for historians around the world. And he uh, is the recipient of that from 20, 2004. And he was elected a fellow of the British Academy in 2005. And I know that that was much more of an introduction than he wanted because he's eager to talk to you all. But ladies and gentlemen, Dr. David Reynolds and In Command of History. Thank you, Jeremy. It's been a great pleasure to come back to Louisiana to renew my acquaintance with the uh, National World War II Museum, uh, and also to deepen my respect for all that it's doing. It's also been a privilege recent now to come to Lafayette and see the Hilliard Art Museum, so I've really enjoyed these few days. Um, in Command of History, how Churchill took command of history, I think this will connect up in various ways with what we've heard earlier on. And let me begin by posing you this simple but challenging question. If you saved your country, arguably saved the world, what do you do for an encore? 
That was the challenge facing Winston Churchill in the summer of 1945. And it was complicated by the fact that in the general election of 1945, uh, the British people, in his view, had repaid him for his wartime service by, as he put it, kicking me out of 10 Downing Street. And this was a considerable shock to him, to his family. And the morning after, as the results came in, and the scale of the defeat was clear, uh, his wife Clementine tried to cheer him up over lunch. And she said, well, my dear, because she knew how tired he was after five years of wartime leadership, she said, perhaps it will be a blessing in disguise. And he looked at her and he growled, at the moment it is quite effectively disguised. <laughs> but what I think that defeat coming on the heels of victory did for Churchill was to lodge in his mind an anxiety about how his achievements would be recognized. Would they be recognized? What would be his role in history? Now, of course, Churchill often said, uh, apropos of history and the verdict of posterity, I shall leave it to history, but remember, I shall be one of the historians. <laughs> and the blessing in disguise in 1945 was that his release from active politics for the moment, and I emphasize the point in this lecture in a moment, uh, um, uh, for a moment, his release from active politics gave him the opportunity to write the memoirs that he would otherwise probably not have been able to do if he had carried on in office, because it's likely that that task would have killed him. So a blessing in disguise. And what he produced was six volumes of memoirs, maybe two million words, Many of you probably have them on your bookshelves. Perhaps fewer of you have actually opened them or even read them, but they grace many bookshelves. And what I want to try and suggest to you is that these were not simply books. They were not simply writings. They were, in their own way, a work of art a work of art by a man who valued art and artistry. And if you like, my text is taken from an unlikely source. Charles de Gaulle, who was a man for whom Churchill, uh, uh, with whom Churchill had many flaming rows, but both these two had deep respect for each other as patriots of their own country. And de Gaulle wrote of Churchill in his own memoirs, as the great champion of a great enterprise and the great artist of a great history. And that's what I want to try and unfold for you a little bit now to at the end of our symposium. So here's the familiar picture of Churchill, the war leader, uh, outside number 10 Downing Street. And here is the other picture, Churchill, the author, in that study at Chartwell, which we've just seen pictures of, underneath Sir John Lavery's picture of a portrait of his wife, Clementine, with that desk um, uh, that was mentioned earlier behind, where he had proofs of his book, uh, the, of his books uh, of the Second World War. And that grows out of that summer of 1945. Let's just kind sort of glimpse it. The, the triumph and the tragedy that Churchill wrote about in the last volume of the memoirs, but it's also a triumph and a tragedy for him personally. Here is Whitehall on, May, on Victory Day, May 1945, 
crowds of people, and somewhere in the middle of that is Churchill being um, born aloft uh, by, by the crowds. So a really heady moment, five years after he took on the job. Here he is moving on his Potsdam in, in July 1945. There he is with uh, President Truman, Joseph Stalin. Roosevelt's now dead. Churchill is carrying on, as he said to one of his secretaries, I want to do the peace as well as the war. And then comes in the middle of the Potsdam Conference, he flies home for the results of the election because it wasn't a normal election. They had to have votes from the uh, troops all over the world brought back, so it took several weeks to do so. So he came back to London for the results, expecting to go back to, um, to, uh, uh, to Potsdam, uh, to Berlin uh, the next day. Mary, Mary Churchill, uh, his, his daughter, was, was with him, and uh, they left some of their luggage in Potsdam because they were going back. And then the verdict of the people comes in. And unlike the, how shall I put this politely, the leisurely pace of the handovers that you transact in the United States, a two-month transition, the verdict of democracy in Britain is fast and brutal. There are the, there's the removal van coming in to take out the effects from, from 10 Downing Street, just a few days later in August. 1945. In fact, so brutal that Churchill had nowhere to go. The Churchills had no home to go to, and in the end, their uh, daughter uh, and son-in-law uh, made way for them in their own home in London for, as a temporary basis. The Churchill was deeply shaken by this, um, but as Clementine said, it was a blessing in disguise, or it proved to be. And one might imagine that in those boxes, are some of the essential ingredients of those memoirs. The papers that he was going to use. Now, Churchill, as we've already heard, was a writer. He made his living by writing. And he had, of course, written major books of history in the past, a two-volume life of his own father, and six volumes on the First World War, the Great War, called The World Crisis, written on a grand scale. Arthur Balfour, who was a rather caustic British uh, politician, uh, wrote to his niece after reading the first volume of The World Crisis, he wrote, I have been reading Winston's autobiography disguised as a history of the universe. <laughs> So Churchill was ready for this task. If you like, he practiced it after World War I. He was now ready to do it again on a grander scale after World War II. But there were certain important problems that had to be overcome. And part of the fascinating story of the memoirs is the enterprise that was involved in actually being able to write them. One of the problems was, of course, that the papers that he had written as prime minister were, strictly speaking, government property. And the uh, cabinet office and the secretaries of the cabinet had been increasingly vigilant about politicians simply walking off uh, with papers, almost put into their briefcase when they left office. Critical here was Sir Edward Bridges, the secretary of the cabinet. Bridges had policed lots of other politicians, but he was totally in awe of Churchill. He'd worked with him during the war, and Churchill's determination to literally take the papers with him of his time in office uh, was accommodated by Bridges in a way that has not happened since for other uh, politicians. But the other thing was also the money. Churchill had to think, is this going to be worthwhile? As we've heard, he, he, um, uh, he earned his money from uh, writing, but he also spent his money. As he once said, my tastes are simple. I like only the best. <laughs> and the best was expensive. So maybe he'd just be better writing little pot boilers like he'd done before, uh, columns in the newspapers about contemporary affairs, which would make him a lot more money. The crucial thing was the deal that he constructed 
uh, with the help of Sir William Berry, Lord Camrose, uh, an old friend, the owner of the Daily Telegraph newspaper. And Camrose put together a syndicate of publishers involving the Daily Telegraph, New York Times, Life magazine in, in the United States, and the publishers Castles in London, which bought, gave Churchill uh, a huge sum of money to write the books, and also arranged with the help of uh, very shrewd tax lawyers, arrangements under which quite legally uh, he was able to avoid substantial amounts of tax. And so at this point, it became a financially viable position. And the other thing that was tremendously important in the case of Camrose and his friends was that they took off Churchill's hands and worse, uh, of Clementine's nightmares, Chartwell, that ruinously expensive uh, home in, in Kent that we've just heard about. And it was Camrose and his friends that paid for Chartwell to become, for, for, for the Churchills to live in Chartwell for the rest of their lifetime, and then it would be passed on to the National Trust, which is a private charity in Britain. It owns large parts of land and old houses and so on. So that running church Chartwell was no longer going to be an expense, it was going to be a pleasure, and there would be, its future would be assured. So the, the deal with the cabinet secretary, the support of Camrose and his friends, for a man uh, they believed deserved that kind of treatment after his war service, this was enabled him to, to get on with the project. Now, as you can imagine with Churchill, these weren't your average memoirs. If you think of most uh, politicians' memoirs, they're written uh, not in tranquility, perhaps in bitterness, but certainly after the end of a political career. Churchill did not stop being a politician. He remained leader of the Conservative Party, and he carried on in active politics, and I'll talk about that uh, in a moment. But they weren't uh, uh, an average a set of memoirs for another reason too, because they weave together a number of different ingredients. It wasn't simply somebody writing about, oh, I remember meeting so-and-so, and I remember that uh, episode during the war. Essentially, I think that the, um, the memoirs have three ingredients, uh, what I call the three Ds for shorthand. The first of them is documents. Documents. This, if you can see, the Prime Minister's personal minutes, May 1940. There will be another set for June 1940, or, uh, July, and so on. There's another set of printed uh, records of the Prime Minister's personal telegrams to uh, British generals in the field or to Stalin, Roosevelt, and so on. Now, Churchill had those telegrams and messages, minutes, printed up all through the war. So while he was prime minister, he was creating the dossier that would be basic to writing his memoirs. He was already looking to the memoir writing process in the summer of 1940. And those documents are the basic ingredients of the book. In fact, the chapters of the book start, and you can see this from the material in the Churchill archives, they start out as pretty much scissors and paste, cutting up those documents and putting them on bits of paper um, separated out. And Churchill said that doing that, putting, up the doc putting down the documents one by one, was like laying down the track. He said, it's like the Canadian Pacific. I lay down the track, it's going to run an awful long way, and then I will put in the stations. And the stations came in two forms. Here's the second of my Ds. Dictation. 
Now, as we've also heard, Churchill didn't do a lot of writing. He dictated, he, he orated his book, actually. Usually later, uh, the preferred time was late at night after a jolly good uh, meal at Chartwell and well fed, well lubricated, he would go upstairs to the study and he would have a long table, uh, probably with various pieces of, of proof and documents, and he would walk up and down, dictating to the secretaries, um, and this would go on for several hours. And what you see here is what they would have typed up on those silent typewriters. He did not want to hear click, 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 so they had a special muffled keys, so he wasn't disturbed. And you, they, uh, he probably had two secretaries on at, uh, 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 for a night. They'd do 30 minutes each and sh uh, change round. So what you get here is the, um, the typescript is the, sorry, I'm not away from the microphone. The typescript is the, um, the uh, what Churchill dictates. And at various points, he's just, you know, the flow is going along. And no, but no secretary would dare to say, uh, Mr. Churchill, could you spell that name? So they just put something down and then put in the margin, check, you know, look at it, let's sort it out later. And then that typescript is by Churchill's bedside next morning when he wakes up and uh, he then scribbles all over it, uh, makes extra comments, changes words, and then that version will be typed up again in clean copy and so this process will go on. Um, and I thought, and maybe it was wishful thinking, but I felt sometimes looking at some of those uh, pages, I could see the coffee stains on the, on the typescript where he'd spilled his coffee during breakfast or something like that. Anyway, so the dictation is part of putting the stations uh, along with the track. But then the other ingredient, this is one that really gives it a depth and a specialness that um, n other memoirs don't have, is that third D, as I call it, the drafts. The enterprise of doing this is uh, that Churchill isn't doing this alone. He obviously needs all the secretaries, but he has, if you like, what we would now call, um, you know, in academia, a research group or something like that. Uh, what he called, in, in racing terminology, the syndicate. Um, a few people who basically did an awful lot of research for him. Because Churchill certainly wasn't going to go off to the libraries and read books and so on. Other people did that for him, and they produced the draft. Now, this one is interesting. This goes, I think, into uh, chapter four of the first volume of Gathering Storm, and it's called The Rise of Hitler. And this is written by a man called Bill Deakin. A moment, I'll talk about him in a moment. But Deakin did a basic uh, draft here. It's, uh, what, 2,100, 2,600 words, I think it says, um, about Hitler. And then Churchill has amended certain things in blue and then again in red. But that draft goes pretty much into the first volume of the memoirs. And what you've got here is a number of people, a number of specialists, adding real depth to the memoirs. And they're the people who not only go to the libraries, they're using the captured German documents, they're using uh, privileged access to other British archives that Edward Bridges has allowed, the cabinet secretary has allowed Churchill and his staff to look at. So these are an interesting group of people. Bill Deakin, there he is. Um, uh, he's on the, uh, the right there, just peering away. Um, uh, an, an Oxford don um, uh, who Churchill had used before the Second World War to help with his Marlborough volumes, his Lives of Marlborough. But what Churchill liked about Deakin was he was, he was not a, a boring academic. He talked back. He was good company over dinner. They had lots of interesting conversations. Uh, Churchill liked those kinds of young men, uh, people who weren't, as, as he said, doormats. Um, Deakin was also someone Churchill greatly admired. In, during the Second World War, he was uh, in British special operations. He was dropped into Yugoslavia to liaise with Tito and the partisans. And I did have the privilege of meeting Bill Deakin before he died. And you could immediately understand, even as a 90-year-old man, why Churchill liked him. He, was, he still had lots of fire. And he told me the story of his first meeting with Tito uh, um, uh, on some cliffs uh, 
in Yugoslavia, um, Tito and his partisans had a particular cave, and they were being shot at by the Luftwaffe periodically, and Deakin and, and Tito started their conversations uh, with the accompaniment of, of Messerschmitts to discuss what exactly British aid could be to the partisans. So Churchill liked that kind of character. Deakin did most of the dra drafts about German policy, Italian policy, uh, that sort of material. Henry Pownall looks rather grim here, but he was an interesting man. He was a senior British commander in, in Asia during the war. Uh, Pownall wrote a lot of the military side of it. So Battle of Alamein, various you know, campaigns in Northwestern Europe. Pownall did the research for that. The other thing about Pownall that was significant and useful as far as Churchill was concerned was that he was bigoted. Uh, which doesn't mean that he was prejudiced. It means that he had been cleared for access to ultra, for the ultra-secret breaking of the German Enigma code. He was one of the people in the, in the know about that, and he was therefore able to look at the kind of transcripts that Churchill had had of German communications. So Pownall handled the military side. Dennis Kelly and Gordon Allen. Gordon Allen's in the middle there. Gordon Allen writes the, most of the naval stuff. He's a retired naval officer, uh, so he's doing the war at sea, both for the British, the stories of the uh, battles in the Pacific, the American Battle of the Pacific. Dennis Kelly is a kind of factotum around um, uh, chart. Well, he's, he's kind of keeps the archives, keeps the papers clear so that they know where they are with different drafts. And another essential member of the syndicate, and we've heard the name before, there's um, down in the bottom is Rufus. Oh, sorry, this is um, I think this is Rufus too down the bottom there. Um, uh, Churchill regarded that as an essential part of, of of writing as well. The pleasure of his company of pets. So, this is quite a striking uh, operation. You can see it's not just the average kind of of memoirs. So. The reception of this, the, the book starts, the first volume comes out in 1948, the last volume is published in Britain in 1954, in the US in 1953, the year before, and it's syndicated in pa papers. Churchill's uh, n writings become, help to make him a celebrity in a different way there. He is, you can see his fan club when he visits Boston in, uh, to talk to MIT in April 1949. Um, there he is winning the Nobel Prize for Literature, 1953, and there's the kind of pub way the book was published, uh, uh, Second World War, Nobel Prize for Literature. That, I think, was the what, a single volume edition that was done uh, later on. But there's another side to the story of the memoirs, which is part of this remarkably many-faceted man. As I said, most politicians write in tranquility or in bitterness when their political career is over. Churchill, I think, because of the shock of that political verdict in 1945, was not willing to let go of active politics. Partly because, like any leader, he did not want to be put on the shelf. But also because I think this, what had happened in that election was profoundly worrying to him. He was a man who, in, at the height of the Second World War, as he said, he, he had the privilege, if you like, of giving the lion's roar, speaking out for Britain and for Britain's uh, place in an embattled world at a moment of, of crisis. And it resonated with the British people. But remember, Churchill did not become prime minister in, in May 1945 because of an election. It, be, he came, it be, became prime minister as a result of a coup within the Conservative Party. So he had never formally put himself before the British electorate for validation. And when he did, in 1945, they gave him the most massive raspberry, the most massive humiliation. I mean, that wasn't just a defeat. It was the worst defeat the Tory party had had since 1906, before that, 1832. Now, this, you know, for a man with a sense of history, was appalling. And I think Churchill 
was determined to carry on and ensure that at some point he would get that validation from the people that he did not, that they'd withheld for a variety of reasons in 1945. Not least because Churchill did not seem in 45 like a man who had a vision of the future of Britain in a peacetime post-war world. And he himself admitted on one occasion when one speech went particularly badly, he says, I have no message for them now. It was like he had a voice in 40, 1940. He hadn't the words to say for a generation that were looking forward to a new Jerusalem after the Second World War. But anyway, Churchill intended, as he said, to stay in the pub till closing time. And that's what he did. So what's remarkable about the memoirs is that they are being composed at the same time as Churchill is playing a huge role as a domestic and international statesman. There's the Fulton speech in March 1946. Churchill, what's known to us as the Iron Curtain speech, what Churchill called the sinews of peace. It's a more complex uh, speech than um, uh, it's often thought of now in terms of the way he talks about the relationships between America, Britain, America, and the Soviet Union. It's one of a number of major speeches Churchill gives. Another one later in 46 at Zurich is about United Europe, about Europe unification, France and Germany coming together. Here he is campaigning in 1950, and here he is prime minister again in 1951. Now, this is all happening at the same time as those memoirs are being written. With the help of the syndicate, but with Churchill doing a huge amount of uh, writing and annotating as well. And that also affects what he says in the memoirs. Because this is a man who is looking forward to his next spell in government. And although he might wish to settle some scores with people from the past, he has a keen sense that the men of the past may also be men of the future, and you might not want to tread on their toes. One of them is Charles de Gaulle. There's de Gaulle, a real pain in the neck during the Second World War, but rather like Churchill holding himself in waiting in the 40s, early 50s, to be called back as the savior of France, which eventually happens in 1958. And Churchill's advisors, not least Christopher Soames, his son-in-law, remind Churchill of de Gaulle's ambitions. And Churchill edits out of his memoirs comments that he'd made during the war or comments he makes in early drafts which could be regarded as denigrate, which were denigratory to, to, to de Gaulle. So we miss, therefore, from the memoirs, some of those choice phrases about de Gaulle, such as a combination of Joan of Arc and Clemenceau, um, <laughs> symptoms of a budding Fuhrer, 1943. And we also miss what I think is probably Churchill's considered verdict on de Gaulle, which is a lovely sentence, I want to read it to you. He wrote, and he, he deleted it, as I say, from the published version. I should be sorry to live in a country governed by de Gaulle. But I should be sorry to live in a world or with a France in which there was no de Gaulle. So the account of his relations with de Gaulle was toned down. Another one was is a story of his relationships with Dwight Eisenhower. Eisenhower, of course, was someone Churchill met for the first time in 1942 when he came over as the commander designate for the torch landings in North Africa. And Churchill dealt with him at great length in the next few years and the planning of D-Day and all the rest of it. Churchill, I think, did not have a huge opinion of Ike as a strategist. I think he gained a growing respect for Eisenhower as a man who could manage a coalition army, an army of allies. I think Churchill definitely doubted Eisenhower's potential as a president, but it wasn't worth saying that in the memoirs or indicating that in the memoirs. Uh, because, of course, in 1953, Dwight Eisenhower becomes president of the United States. 
Churchill has been you know, 18 months or so as Prime Minister of Britain. Uh, so when he's writing the final volumes of the last two volumes of the memoirs, he sends these to Eisenhower, the draft, the chapters that particularly relate to some of their disagreements over uh, campaigns in France, to Eisenhower to read and vet. And Eisenhower hands this over to his wartime chief of staff, Walter Beadle Smith, and Beadle goes through this and he edits like eight chapters. And Churchill takes uh, note of all those comments and he actually deletes even more to ensure that there's not going to be um, uh, any, um, any problems with Ike coming out of those, uh, those memoirs. One of the other casualties of the fact that Churchill's in active politics and he's sensitive to some of those implications, so there's Eisenhower reviewing troops in uh, Devon in 1944, George Patton on the extreme uh, left, um, Sir Norman Brooke, Edward Bridges' successor as Cabinet Secretary, is the vetter of uh, the enforcer of official censorship. Churchill's agreement with Bridges is that he will give the government a chance to read these, vol these drafts of, of all the, the, the whole book and offer comments where they f the government feels that this uh, this trespasses too much on issues of national security. And the area that Norman Brooke is particularly concerned about is the ultra-secret, the fact that uh, the British, the Americans, had broken the German codes, the signals intelligence that was so important. Now, Churchill initially assumed that he would write about his part in doing that, because Churchill was particularly striking as a British prime minister in his awareness of how important signals intelligence was. And he just loved it. He loved getting these sort of golden eggs all the time, as he called them, bo special boxes with the decrypts um, from, from German messages. And he started putting some of this in the early drafts. Norman Brooke, um, well, I was going to say writes to Churchill. Usually he had a, a nice, leisurely, thoughtful dinner uh, at his club with Churchill, where they kind of went over these issues um, without too much written down. But Norman Brooke explains to Churchill that actually the methods of the, uh, that were used to break the German Enigma code were still in use by British intelligence in dealing with certain minor, well, quite a lot of minor countries, not perhaps the you know, Soviet Union or whatever, in the post-war period. It would be hugely detrimental to security if Churchill's told that story. And also, if Churchill told that story, then there were huge numbers of people who had been involved at Bletchley Park, there they are, um, cracking the ultra, um, who would then say, fine, we were told never to tell anything about this. But Sir Winston Churchill has talked about it, so it would open the floodgates. And Churchill is persuaded that that is a real issue of national security. So you don't read anything. It's just one or two things that got through by chance in the memoirs where you hint, uh, there's a hint that something special was going on. But the story of the ultra secret is kept until uh, it's opened up uh, officially in the 1970s. So you've got this fascinating sense of a book that is written in a most unusual way as, as almost a, a f in places almost a full scale history of the war but he's very selective in some of the treatments because of the importance of the past for the future. So, let me need, I need to come to an end. Um, there we are, six volumes, Making History. Um, uh, making History and confirming Churchill's reputation. There's the state funeral. And there's the interment in Bladen next to Blenheim Palace where he was, uh, where he was born. And his physician, Lord Moran, writes at the end of his memoir, in a country churchyard, in the stillness of a winter evening, in the presence of his family and a few friends, Winston Churchill was committed to English earth, which in his finest hour he had held inviolate. It's a wonderful phrase, I think. And 
he, it vindicates, I think, that sense that Churchill had, and he expressed this in 1938, that immortality he didn't believe in an afterlife, but he said, words are the only things that last forever. This man of words who had to not only do history, but write history to ensure his place in it. But what I also want to say, and it picks up on some of the things we heard earlier about the Graham Sutherland picture, is that those six volumes, as I've tried to suggest, are a work of art in their own way. It's a big tapestry. It's a great tapestry. Um, it's not an impressionistic sense of a few events in the Second World War. It is, if you like, the cold, profound effort of memory composed from numerous detailed studies by Churchill and his syndicate and infused with an acute sense of color to produce an enduring masterpiece. The great champion of a great history and the great, the great cha champion of a great enterprise and the great artist of a great history. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Um, questions, please raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone to you. Anyone? Right behind me? To your far left, sir. Yeah, okay. Dr. Reynolds, let me begin by thanking you for your advocacy of public history. I think events like this show the importance of it and your, your work in that regard deserves mention here. Thank you. Um, it was said that the, 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 the King James Bible is the greatest work written by committee. I did not quite know until now, even as a historian and somebody that's read a great deal in Churchill, just how much of a committee effort this work was. Um, how was he as a colleague in this regard? Because you see some of the popular representations of how difficult he is, and I, I, I think that that's probably uh, on point in, in a number of ways. But uh, in terms of, of those individuals who you're mentioning here in the syndicate, how, how how was the working relationship between them as far as, as far as your studies have shown? I think Churchill had a, a varying degree of respect. For someone like Deakin, I think he had a lot of time and affection. Um, uh, I think for perhaps Gordon Allen, it was more of a workmanlike relationship. But you, know, say this, you say this is work by committee. Yeah, the other way of putting it, and Dennis Kelly put it quite well, you know, it was um, it was like a master chef. So there are various sous chefs in the kitchen, but Kelly said you always knew who had designed the recipes and the presentation and so on. And that is part of, I think, what, what Churchill was, was, was able, able to do. Um, Churchill's relations with his staff, I, I, have, I did talk to um, you know, a, a few of people who'd worked for him as secretaries, and one had a really a profound sense that he could be quite insufferable. He was so absorbed in things he was doing, and there were times when he just seemed to be totally, indi totally indifferent to what, what their concerns were and so on. But he had this ability to, there would be a sudden sort of flash of humanity. He would look at somebody in a, a secretary in a very piercing way. She said, how are you today, my dear? And there would be some brief moment where you just felt you know, he connected. But most of them uh, said, really, it didn't matter if he was rude or he was preoccupied. You had this sense of being caught up in a, a, an enterprise which was far bigger than yourself and really mattered to history, to the country, and whatever. And I think that's an important part of, of leadership, that sense of, an, of a, a person who can sweep you along into a cause that he or she has envisaged and envisioned, and he had that. Let me see any, yep, yeah, to your right. Me, you covered all the areas, so there's no questions. Just a moment, ma'am, I'll be right to you, please. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, I think that I have a sense that in our country, uh, Churchill is very revered as a hero and a leader. And I'm just wondering, uh, how does the British public view him now? I think in public memory in, in much the same way. Um, and if I could just add to that, um, part of what has concerned me as someone who's written about Churchill is the way that there's a tendency for him to become a sort of two-dimensional figure, an icon on the wall. And what I think is fascinating about Churchill is to get a sense of him three-dimensionally, warts and all. This is a man who had many flaws, but they are kind of caught up in the sense of a, a, a huge human being. I mean, you've just got a sense of it today. If you think of the, the facets of, 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 of what we've heard about, you know, here's a man who is a, a politician, uh, a, a, a man who's experienced war, who's fought, who's killed people, who's ne been near death, um, a, a man who is, uh, does painting for a pastime, and it, he does it seriously and well. A man who is a bricklayer with a union card. Uh, a man who writes and who can write in all sorts of ways. You know, big books, small articles, and so on. I mean, you know, I think of the, the um, comment of Harry Hopkins. Roosevelt sent Hopkins over in January 41 to find out actually part, 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 partly about Churchill's drinking habits, but generally whether, you know, was he just really an old reactionary Tory? And uh, Churchill knew very well why Hopkins had come over. He also knew that it was really important to cultivate the Americans. This is still w when you, uh, you hadn't quite woken up to the significance of the Second World War, but we won't get onto that. You were neutral, and um, uh, you had good reasons for that. And, um, and so Churchill really turns it on for Hopkins. He takes him to factories. He takes him down to London to see the ruins. He takes him up to Scotland and, and all the rest of it. And um, on one occasion, he's had you know, several hours of conversation and argument with Hopkins about war issues. And then about 10 o'clock, he goes off and starts dictating answers to telegrams and so on. And Hopkins, who was no laggard, Hopkins sort of sits back in a chair and he says, Jesus Christ, what a man. <laughs> we'll take one more question. I'll try to get there based on time on the far end, but right in front of you, David. All right. Uh, I just wonder how Churchill acquired those young women that were doing the typing in the middle of the night. That, that is a serious question, and I must be <laughs> very careful how I answer it. Um, Madam, I would have to say, I think in an entirely proper way, they usually, um, they, uh, some of them live locally around Chartwell. Um, they were uh, always taken back home in cars at the end of the, you know, 2 a.m. or whatever it was. Um, some of them were, if it, they were in London, they would be uh, government typists or whatever. But um, uh, no, this was uh, the, you know, the arrangements were all, you know, they were paid for properly and their work was, you know, done in, a, I think, an entirely proper way. And as I say, they were, most of them, not all of them, but the large majority were totally devoted to him and, and felt it was one of the high points of their life to have worked for him. Dr. Reynolds, the last question is all the way to your left towards the front. So, uh, so Roosevelt was concerned about Churchill's drinking, Lincoln was concerned about Grant's drinking. After a while, did uh, Roosevelt decide that he was going to find out what Churchill was drinking and send him a couple of cases of it? Uh, I, I think Roosevelt began to get wind of the fact that quite a lot of the, um, uh, the drink was watered down. Uh, Eleanor, his wife, uh, who had, you know, fairly stern views about a lot of things. Eleanor greatly disapproved of Franklin being kept up at night by Winston um, when he should be getting to bed. Um, she did not like him at all. 
And in fact, one of the interesting things, I'm going slightly off, uh, off, off the tangent here, but was the relationship between um, Eleanor and Clementine, Clementine Churchill's wife. And Clementine is interesting because she is such a, a, an accomplished person in her own way, and yet, as she said, she made Winston her life's work. Uh, she was an accomplished linguist. She probably she could have gone to university if she wanted to. She remained a, a serious liberal. And Eleanor was fascinated by the way in which, whereas she was, you know, she developed a role of her own as a columnist and as a traveler around the world and as an emissary, Clementine was very much subordinate to Winston, yet there was a real personality there. Um, so the, the story of the two men is also a story of the, the two women, which is also a fascinating story. Probably, actually, you know, a good topic for another conference at some point, Jeremy. So. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. David Reynolds. And now, nothing against the previous five speakers. We are in for a real treat for some final thoughts to be presented by somebody who has... We have Winston in our heart and in our spirit. She literally has Winston in her DNA. The Honorable Emma Soames is the daughter of Winston's youngest, Mary Soames. Um, I find it interesting and a, a bit heartening, may, being the father of a daughter, that you have pursued one of Winston's many careers in journalism. She served as an editor for many of the leading publications in Great Britain, including the Telegraph magazine. So to finish out our Churchill and Conflict and Culture Symposium, it's my pleasure to introduce the Honorable Emma Soames. Thank you, Jeremy, for those kind words. And I'd just like to say what a huge pleasure and how exciting it is for me to be here in Lafayette, Louisiana, and to experience for myself the warmth of a Southern welcome and your wonderful, inch-increasing Southern hospitality. <laughs> I would particularly like to thank Madeline and Paul Hilliard and also indeed Catherine for being so, making my trip such a wonderful, smooth and enjoyable event. And above all, what a great privilege it is for me to be here with you all today but I have to say that compared to the roster of knowledgeable and distinguished speakers who've come before me, I fear that what I can offer you are meager rations indeed. I had wrongly assumed that in popular culture, Churchill, the memory of Churchill and his works would be fading by now, more than 50 years after his death with so much going on in this frantic world. So it is wonderful that there is still such a desire to examine and celebrate the life and many achievements of Winston Churchill, and to find that Hollywood and historians continue to burrow into the many extraordinary aspects of his life. Yes, I did know my grandfather. I knew him rather well. But if you are hoping to hear tales of how he discussed great events with me, or how he confided in me the secrets of statesmanship, I'm afraid I'm going to be a great disappointment to you. I knew him from my birth in 1949 until his death when I was 14. And I knew him really only as a much loved and revered grandfather, no more, no less. And there I am as a wriggling toddler sitting on his lap. My mother, Mary, was the youngest child of Winston and Clementine. And after her marriage to the dashing young Grenadier Guards officer, Christopher Soames, in 1947, the young couple moved into Chartwell Farm that nestled in the valley below the Churchill's country home. My father became a close confidant of Sir Winston, and living so close to her parents enabled my mother to continue the very close relationship she enjoyed with them right to the end of their lives. And indeed, as they grew older, she became an increasing support to them. I was just a few years old when my grandfather came down the hill 
to pay a state visit to his new granddaughter. When told by my mother what they, she planned to call me, he replied, very good, very good. If there had been more Emmas, there would have been more Nelsons. <laughs> so living, um, as I grew up, we saw our grandparents every day. Accompanied by our beloved nanny, we would walk up the hill from the farm to Chartwell itself. There we frolicked on the lawns, played croquet at a very basic level, and swam in the swimming pool. This, I have to say, was only a marginal, marginally successful enterprise of Grandpapa's, who dug it himself when um, they bought Churchill, the Chartwell in the 20s. The trouble was he had dug it so deep and so large that despite being heated by a boiler big enough to heat the Queen Mary, it was memorably cold. <laughs> but after swimming in it, we would go for tea with them. So we would walk back up the hill and go to the dining room to find the most wonderful tea laid out for us. This featured exquisite little cucumber sandwiches and tiny chocolate cakes. Indeed, the food at Chartwell was always delicious. My grandmother ran a very tight ship in that regard. I remember long Sunday lunches starring tiny lamb cutlets and raspberry sorbet with delightful lumps of cream in it. We grandchildren sat right at the end of the long table and were riveted when the budgegar, Toby, was released from his cage and walked down the table emptying the salt cellars as he went. At the other end of the table, my mother sat with her father, competitively smoking cigars. They played a game to see how long they could grow a tail of ash on the end of the cigar. And Grandpapa became very cross if my mother won. <laughs> there is an expression in my family that comes from my grandfather when a good time an interesting conversation was happening over a meal. And uh, my grandmother would say, oh, we must, you know, we must go, go to the drawing room, lunch is over. And he would say, Clemmy, Clemmy, let us command the moment to remain. <laughs> Sometimes after lunch in a stately little procession, we grandchildren would follow Winston down to the goldfish pond there he would sit down and stamp his stick on the paving stones while the fish came rushing to be rewarded with handfuls of wriggling worms. Sadly, we were banned from this delightful activity. He also loved visiting the pigs at Chartwell Farm. Accompanied by my father and several of us grandchildren, he would stand for hours leaning on the gate, rubbing their backs with his stick. And as we all know, he had very clear views about pigs. Cats look down on you, dogs look up to you, and pigs treat you as an equal. <laughs> In many ways, Chartwell was like a mistress to my grandfather. He poured money and energy that sometimes that he barely had into it. And many of his books and lecture tours went to fund the works at Chartwell and of course to support his always extravagant lifestyle. Um, it was here that he learned how to do brickwork and built many of the walls you still see there today. He built for my mother when she was seven, and there's a charming picture of her unveiling the, the, the property, uh, this little cottage called the Marycott, built into the walls of Chartwell, where I indeed had the pleasure of playing tea parties. And invite, I remember inviting my grandmother to tea in the Marycott. Uh, above all, though, it was at Chartwell that he painted interiors of the house, the gardens in every season and in inclement weather. Chartwell was captured by his brush in all seasons and in all its moods. <laughs> 
above all, it was the view of Chartwell that I think inspired so much of what he did. He used to sit for hours as an old man, as I remember him, in his Stetson hat with cigar in hand, looking out across the Weald of Kent. And indeed, it, I think that is his vision of England, that view. And indeed, it's above in the skies, above that view, that so many dogfights happened in 1940-41. Um, the National Trust has been uh, reverent in its dealings with Chartwell. It's rearranged as it was in the 30s, so the house is not quite as I remember it in the 1950s. But they took on my mother, who grew up at Chartwell and called herself the Chartwell child, indeed. And um, they took her on as a consultant to make sure that every detail was um, historically correct. So even the curtain fabrics were specially woven. As children, we were not told that we were the grandchildren of England's greatest hero. My parents just simply didn't want to spoil us. It may sound incredible, but I didn't realize quite how important my grandfather was until his death. He was, as you know, given the most incredible state funeral, and it was the first to be granted to a commoner uh, for 60 years, and indeed there hasn't been another since. Um, it was preceded by three days of his coffin lying in state in Westminster Hall, where four guardsmen, 24 hours a day, stood at each corner of the coffin and the entire hall was lit only by the four candles by the coffin. And uh, there was a steady stream of people, the queue of people to pay their respects, went right down the embankment and across uh, Lambeth Bridge. And uh, we could get into the hall um, by another route but I just remember standing there and it, it was sort of the complete silence except for the shuffling of people's feet as they walked past the coffin. Um, it was an amazing experience to, to witness and it was at that moment, I have to say, that the penny dropped as to just how deeply, deeply revered was my grandfather. On the day of the funeral, which was bone-chillingly cold and um, equally missed, you know, good English, old English fog, my sister Charlotte and I travelled in a gun carriage behind the coffin. Um, the streets from, um, West, from Westminster Hall to St Paul's Cathedral were packed with people. They were literally five or six deep down the pavements, all the way from uh, the Abbey to St. Paul's Cathedral. And again, the, the, the expressions on people's faces, they were cold and gray, and they were absolutely wrapped with grief and reverence. Um, and you could hear a pin drop, except you couldn't hear a pin drop because the, the sound effects was just the sound of the guardsman's um, boots on metal road and the occasional shouted command of their officers. So all we could see from the little windows of the carriage that we traveled in was row upon row of, of faces. When we reached our seats in the cathedral, um, there before us was the Queen, President de Gaulle, and most of the leaders of the free world, um, which was a, a stunning thing. I thought we should have been coming in rather before them rather than after them. And as we sang the Battle Hymn of the Republic, which was my grandfather's favorite hymn, a single shaft of wintry sunlight came through the high windows of St. Paul's Cathedral and fell on the coffin. It was a spine-tingling moment, and I truly felt that all of us who were there that day were part of history. <laughs> 
Then we, the body went on um, a train to Bladen, and again, all the way up from London to Oxfordshire to Blenheim, where his, he was buried. There were people all along the hedgerows, at every gate, um, anywhere that had a view of the train, um, people, people, all the way, many, many children. And 50 years ago, on the 50th anniversary of that day, um, I walked through the cathedral and we retraced his last journey when we traveled on the barge that had carried the coffin on its last journey up the Thames. Um, of five children, only my mother outlived both her parents. After her last surviving sibling, Sarah, died, my mother sometimes referred to herself as the last of the Moicans. And she was a very great Moican. My mother was modest, wickedly funny, clever, dignified, but unstuffy. And she was loving and fiercely loyal to her father. Um, my mother was happy and proud to be her father and mother's daughter and her husband's wife and her children's mother. She was the only non-royal daughter of a Knight of the Garter to be made a Lady of the Garter in her own right. Um, an order that has been going since 1378 and is lodged in St. George's Chapel, Windsor. In conclusion, I'd like to say this. To those of us who've lived in Churchill's shadow, it is reassuring to know that it is not us who are inadequate, but he who was exceptional. He was not normal. He was quite simply superhumanly talented, and he combined it with being hugely hardworking and put his talents and hard work to the service of his countrymen. Um, and the world should judge itself fortunate that a time when there really were choices, choices that had to be fought for, this abnormal and extraordinary man was at the center of events and at the height of his powers. I will end with the words that my mother composed to sit on um, the wreath that she put on his coffin I owe to you not only the love of a grateful child, but what Engl every English man and woman owe you, freedom itself. Thank you. Emma, thank you so much for uh, shedding light on, uh, on this individual. I think, as you mentioned, for those who lived in Churchill's shadow, I think everybody in this room and beyond still live in the shadow of that great man. Um, I'd like to uh, close out my remarks here before passing it to our, our friend and partner, Luann. Um, and now that she sat down, I'm going to ask all of our speakers to stand up one final time. Richard Frankel, Rob Satino. Allison Lee, Keith Huxon, David Reynolds, Emma Soames, thank you so much for making this a wonderfully enlightening and enjoyable day. Um, as I mentioned before the last session began, Oates and Marino, thank you so much. This is, um, these programs are not possible without great organizations and individuals, so thank you. Uh, thanks to you, the audience. We could put these together, and if you all didn't show up, what would be the point? Um, it's, it's great to see so many people are that interested. Um, from all ages, I'm going to go from about 8 to 80, I think, from the, uh, the kids, the students up there. Um, who had an enjoyable and or great time? Raise your hand. Great. Who has seen the Churchill Art Exhibit at the Hilliard Art Museum? Raise your hand. 
who is going to make sure that they see it before the run of show concludes. Great. Uh, who has signed up, I know the answer to this, who has signed up for the World War II Museum's February 8th Symposium on the Alta Conference? Thank you, I knew you did. Uh, there is a lot of space available, uh, some space available. There's a lot of you, we can't accommodate you all, so if you had a great time today, know that on Saturday, February 8th, you will have a great time at the World War II Museum featuring uh, five distinguished historians, much like we had today and talking about this final meeting of the big three, Winston, Franklin Roosevelt, and Joseph Stalin. Um, I know Luann's gonna do this, but I've got to say thank you. People say thanks to Paul enough. Thank you, Madeline. <laughs> thank you so much. Of course, thank you to Paul, but you share him with us. You share him with everybody, and I don't think he'd be able to do everything we expect of him without you behind him. So thank you very much, Madeline. And Paul, of course, thank you. And for this program, thank you to Catherine, too. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to work with you. Um, Tatum and the AV crew, thank you very much up in the booth. Um, ben, Jolie, Susie, who's not here, Greta, who's not here. Thank you with the Hilliard Art Museum staff. You guys were great partners, and you are ably and wonderfully led by Luann Greenwald, who now gets to close out the program. Thank you so much, Luann. And a round of applause for Jeremy being a great MC. Yeah, I just want to say thank you so much. What a wonderful, warm closing to a fascinating morning. Um, really, thank you so much. And I want to let you know that the exhibition is on view. Uh, we're open till 5 today. It'll be up through March 21st. Uh, Saturdays were open 10 to 5 and there are boxed lunches in the lobby. So thank you all again for being a part of this, and good day. <laughs>